let's be honest for a moment with ourselves. Do you think that you have mastered sex? Or do you step into a sexual experience and wonder, I wish that I could do more. I wish more was possible here. Maybe you want to last longer. Maybe you want to please your partner better. Maybe you want to feel more in control of when and how you orgasm. But unfortunately, you're probably not sure what to do. Sure, maybe you could try a new position or who knows, maybe you decide to take Viagra. Whatever it is, you just keep end up in the same place, having similar sex, wondering, how can I make this better? In today's episode, we are going to cover exactly how to build your sexual confidence so that you can step into any sexual experience with a deep knowing that it will be everything you want and more. Welcome back to The Naked Connection. This is the show that supports driven men to build deeper connections and have better communication and sex. What's up, you guys? It's Kirsten, and I'm on a mission to create a world where everyone is having epic sex and experiencing deep connection. Today, we are joined by a very special human, Fabienne Anique. I met Fabienne at a Tantra retreat, actually, a few years ago, and I knew the moment that I met her When I started my podcast, I just had to have her come on to the show because you guys are about to meet a woman with deep wisdom and this beautiful soul who, yes, is truly an expert in men's sexuality. And she is here to share with you how you can master your cock and unleash your sexual energy. Let's get after it. Fabienne, Anique, welcome to The Naked Connection. I'm so excited to jam out with you today. Thanks so much for having me. I was laughing to myself before hopping on here. I'm like, here are two women that are passionate about men's sexuality. And I would love to hear, I know I have my own personal experience of how I've landed here, but what led you to where you are now in this field and industry? Yeah, so... A lot of different aspects have led me to here. And when I first started working in the realm of sexuality, it was actually with women. And it was, I I got into the world of sexuality because of dealing with my own challenges, traumas from early on in life. And I, I saw from very early on, okay, sexuality is something big. It's something that can impact us really deeply. And there's also a lot we can do to heal. My family was incredibly supportive in my own healing process. And so I understood from a young age that like healing was possible and and growth was possible. And the approach to sexuality, we could deepen that in so many ways and, and in really healthy ways. So when I was when I was in my own healing journey in my early 20s, I started to then work with women after that. And this little voice kept coming in. You got to work with men. You got to work with men. And so many of the women I was was talking to as well, and the women I I was working with, a lot of them shared that they were healing a lot and that they were growing a lot, but that their partners or their lovers didn't have as many resources for healing, for growth in the sexual realms, and that they either were feeling like they couldn't quite meet each other or they were actually the women were actually feeling like they were being re-traumatized by by patterns that were happening and then I heard from a lot of their partners like I don't really know how or where to grow in this realm like I need support too I have trauma too I have challenges as well Mm -hmm. and so it just kept coming back again and again to there there is support for men out there around sexuality but I find there's not as much as there is for women and particularly there aren't a lot of women who work with men, and that's a very particular dynamic. There are certain men who would only work with a man. There are certain men who would only work with a woman around these things who can only open up or at that stage in their process would only want to open up to a woman. For some men, it's with only with men. And another thread to this was throughout my life, there has always been this comfort with boys and with men <clears throat> and a deep connection to and a deep appreciation for men. There was also pain around men and that was a huge piece of my own healing and that has woven in. I think you can probably 
uh, resonate with when we choose to work with men, we need to heal our own relationships to men in so many mm-hmm. ways, which there's so much to say on that. But yeah, this theme of the comfort, the naturalness, the closeness that I felt with men, both in a friendship way, then also in my partnerships and loverships, there are like men all around me who I did really love and I did really appreciate. And so there's always been this feeling of we're in this together and we can support each other with this and through this. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing all of that. It's a beautiful story to hear the path that's led you here. And it's so interesting. I, I totally resonate. The part of the reason why I wanted to do this show and all of this work is largely around the same feeling of, in my own experience, recognizing that same kind of question of like, where are the resources for men? Where is the information for men? So yeah. one thing that I would love to talk to you about that I found in in talking with men about everything that comes with intimacy is feeling this pressure to perform yeah. And I'm curious if you have experience with working through that or like why that is something that so many of them men end up carrying around and how to release that. Yeah, such a good question. And honestly, one of the widest topics within men's sexuality that I see again and again with clients is this feeling of I need to perform. <clears throat> and I think it comes from a few different areas, but One is that from a very young age, I think men are taught you need to be a certain way. You need to not do ABC. Don't cry. Don't. And this isn't for everyone, right? But this is like a sort of on a grander scheme and on a societal level. Don't cry. Don't show your emotions too much. Don't show weakness. Don't show excitement. That's another big one. Don't show that you're too excited or too into something or too in pleasure. And so from a very young age, I think boys are taught to start to put their own experience into a little box, into a little cage, but then also perform, take care of people, which also there's nothing wrong with taking care of people. Like there is, it's so beautiful. We can support boys to be like, yes, provide for the people you care for. Do amazing, beautiful things in your life. But when we place all of the worth on how it looks for you to do. That's where it starts to get twisted. Mm -hmm. I think that happens for so many boys, for so many men, where there's this close down your own experience, but then perform, do it right, make it look good, be the best in sports. Then add some pornography into the mix. Here's what it's supposed to look like. Here's what sex is supposed to look like. Here's how you should be able to perform. This is what's going to make her be in pleasure. and. As we all know, pornography is primarily not all pornography, but a lot of it is acting and it's not necessarily the male actor is often, first of all, it is an actor, right? Is like training for this. Also, oftentimes is taking Viagra or some other kind of medication. Oftentimes, the if there's a woman in pleasure, sometimes she's actually in pleasure. Often, again, it's acting. And so there's this whole perform aspect within pornography that is that has become i would say the primary sex education for so many boys and so then they learn i need to do what i'm seeing and then it becomes this totally unrealistic thing that they're striving towards that we're striving towards and simultaneously is separated from being connected to your own pleasure being connected to your own yes and no being connected to your own emotions and sensations and all of that yeah and in response to your question about what we what can we do there, one of the, there are so many pieces here, I'm like immediately jumping to my mind, but bringing sex back to sensation, mm. I think is one of the most powerful things that we can do because so many of us, not just men, have this performative approach to sex. I need to look this way. I need to act this way. I need to come this way. I need to make you come this way. And when we bring it back to sensational experience, which requires often quite a bit of training or some training, when we bring it back to sensation, it becomes about the actual pleasure in our bodies. It comes into, it brings it back to the connection between me and my lover as opposed to the performative quality. And I find that moving things more and more closely to sensation and training training the body and the nervous system and the psyche for 
being able to experience more sensation, more emotion, more texture can help so much with that. And that also needs to come with some letting go of I'm only worthy. I'm only a good lover if uh, I perform like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense. I actually was just very recently exploring a lot of the sensitivity and the sensation. And in so many ways, I think people, it sounds backwards to people to be like, become more aware of your sensations, become more sensitive because there's like a fear of losing control. But actually, from what I understand, you have more control and like more pleasure and more expansion in what's possible. Completely. When you bring yourself out of sensitivity, this is something I see with a lot of with a lot of my clients when let's say you don't want to ejaculate quickly. And so when you start to get super turned on, you think about something else. You distract yourself Mm -hmm. with the intention of that's going to bring my arousal level down. But what actually happens is maybe it does because you're distracting yourself. But then not only are you not present with your partner, which is what your partner most likely wants more than anything is your (laughs) presence. But also, you actually are becoming less aware of the sensations. And when you're less aware of the sensations, you're also in less control. Mm-hmm. And when you develop a, a greater sense, a greater sensitivity, instead of going from a 30% arousal like that and then distracting yourself to drop back down, you start to be able to trace, oh, I know what it feels like to be at a 70, 80, 90%. And I can actually be so aware of it and so in tune to it that I have more control because I can sense where I'm at and then use different tools like my breath, like my pelvic floor pulses, like any of these tools, like relaxation in order to actually be in not like a rigid control, but a soft embodied control of where I'm at. Yeah. I love that. And you mentioned something about being aware of your partner. And because I think, I mean, I can usually tell when I'm with someone if they're in their own world or if they're in a different world or if they're actually present in the experience. And what would you say is a good way to practice being more attuned to yourself, attuned to your partner? Yeah. Mm. It's such a good question. And Something that I'm constantly saying is you can't feel her if you can't feel yourself. We oftentimes are either feeling ourselves or the other person, whereas like I'm so in my own experience that I'm totally unattuned to my partner, or I'm so worried about how my partner's feeling that I am actually not connected to my own arousal or my own levels of arousal or my own body. And so I think, once again, bringing it closer to sensation And maintaining, it's like the practice for me there is how can I be fully aware of what's happening internally? How can I be so fully immersed in my experience while also attuning to my partner, which means maybe that's visually, like maybe I'm opening my eyes and seeing my partner. Maybe I'm asking little check-in questions every now and then to, to check in and see if we're still there. It's maintaining that focus and that presence simultaneously on self and other Mm -hmm. and noticing if we're going fully into one and losing track of the other. And it sounds complicated, but it's really a matter of, can I feel what's happening in my body as I'm present to this person here? If I start going into my head, if I start going into future or past and I start worrying or anticipating how can I bring it back to sensation in my body and how can I feel myself and how can I feel my partner at the same time? And once again, it it might sound complex, but when you just try it, it's in a way the simplest thing is just tracking self while tracking the other. And she'll know, she notices, like you just said, like we can feel it all. We can feel it so much. I mean, my partner, like he... Well, if I if he notices me go in my head, this is like this, yes, lovemaking, but also just dancing. If he notices me go in my head, immediately he's like, where'd you go? He can feel it. We can all feel it. Yeah. He's incredibly perceptive, but, but we can all feel that. We notice when someone's 
in their head when someone's going into the into anywhere other than right here. And right here, what is happening are sensations, our senses, our smells, our whatever we're hearing, whatever we're seeing, whatever we're feeling internally. Yeah. I love that you shared that example of dancing because sometimes I think about how to integrate some of these practices or approaches in sex, but first approaching them in a different place. Because sometimes I find that it's more accessible if that element of intimacy, the like sex, like sexual arousal isn't there. So if you're with someone over dinner or dancing or just connecting, talking, walking, whatever it is, practicing that, being like, how aware am I of myself and of them at the same time? I would imagine like that helps so that when you are having sex, it is a lot easier to get in the habit of doing that. Completely. Yeah. That's where you can, that's where you can practice it. And and so that it becomes embodied. So that level of listening becomes completely natural. Yeah. And I think too about how like so many men, as you're saying, like love to provide and give and are just like such givers when it comes to intimacy that there is like that element of losing their own pleasure in the process. And like, how can, if someone's listening and maybe they like really love to give to their partner or partners, be able to turn back and like also experience pleasure for themselves? Yeah. Yeah. I see that so often. And it's funny, when I first started working with men, my expectation was that I would have, I would work with men who, that I would see the pattern of men who take for themselves, but then their partners feel like they're not receiving. Mm. And there is definitely some of that, but I see a lot of men who really want to give and they give and give to the point of feeling distracted from their own pleasure or not feeling like they actually can receive, like often that it's actually uncomfortable to receive. Mm-hmm. And a couple pieces that I always inquire into here is, is there something that you feel you are needing to prove by giving? Like, I need to prove that I'm a good partner. This goes for everybody, but we'll say specifically for men right now. Do I need to prove that I'm a, a good partner, a good lover? Do I need to prove my worth? Do I believe that I will only be loved if I perform in this way? And just starting to pull those apart and look at what's behind that, that doesn't mean now you just don't give to your lover. Like, it's amazing to give to your lover and to want to provide and to want to give pleasure and see your partner in pleasure. But is this beautiful area for us to look at what's, is there anything that that feels not integrated yet that's behind it? And how can I care for those parts of myself? I don't necessarily need to, yeah, not do anything that I'm already doing, but rather just it, it helps us to come into more, more balance, more harmony internally. And, and then also looking at our relationship or your relationship to Am I deserving of receiving? How hard is it for me to receive pleasure? Mm-hmm. How hard is it? Is there something that I'm avoiding? Is it uncomfortable to receive pleasure from a partner? Is it hard for me to receive pleasure in general? Is it scary for me to actually be deeply in my body? What aspects come up when you're in the, the space of receiving? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, and that's probably when they come and work with you. I actually was just thinking about this a recent, like sharing a personal experience that I had with a man. And Because I think that this is something that can happen quite often is that they're so focused on making sure that the woman reaches an orgasm and that becomes like the primary focus and the primary goal. And then all attention and pressure is placed on that happening, which for me personally, that makes it like extremely challenging. And so I know it comes from this really it feels like it comes from a caring place of, I want you to feel really good and I want you to have this. What would you say to help men in the moment when that is their desire, but it's actually pushing the partner away from having an orgasm or away from what they're looking for? One thing I would say, there's this concept of goal-oriented sex where it's, we're trying to get somewhere. We're trying to accomplish something. Yeah. And so... I've heard a lot of people talk about, okay, let's move away from goal-oriented sex. But I also think that goals are really helpful. I think that having a goal can actually help us have a point of focus to point ourselves towards. And so my invitation here is always, 
what would you, what can we shift the goal into? So instead of my goal is to make her come this many times, my goal is to actually unlock as much pleasure as possible from her body. My goal is to experience so much intimacy and closeness. My, my goal is to, or my intention or my desire is to see her in as much pleasure as possible. And so when it becomes less about a, a point that needs to happen, like an orgasm, it's like, how much more pleasure can we bring out? How much more enjoyment? How much more intimacy? How much more closeness? How much more juiciness? Whatever it is, allowing the, if having a goal is supportive, allowing the goal to be to be to allow even more of what's already here, if that makes sense. Like how much more can I delight in her juices? How much more can I can I absolutely devour her goodness? And so just looking at what's the goal and whose idea was that? Whose idea was <laughs> it that for this to be successful, she needs to have three orgasms? Mm-hmm. Because chances are that wasn't her idea. And chances are, it wasn't even your idea. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Somebody, somebody made, at some point planted this idea. Of that's what being a good lover is. And mm-hmm. that's a great place to also get to know yourself and your lover. Of what would make this the best possible experience? What are the top three things that she looks for in a lover? And how can I be even more of that? Which like, how can I be more present? How can I be more tuned into my own pleasure? How can I be mm-hmm. more integrated between what, what whatever the determining factors are or suggestive factors are what makes a good lover that that is often something that we're not expecting and so asking ourselves and also asking our lovers what does that even look what would that look like to you yeah okay this is such gold because I often hear that the goal removal part and I agree I think it's nice to have something to focus on otherwise it's where are we going what's happening here and so shifting that I actually was having a conversation with a friend recently who's just new into dating again and was like really wanting to find a life partner. And so was going into dating it from this space of this is my goal and this is what I'm looking for. And it wasn't going well. Like that's like a repel can be repelling if you're I'm looking for my husband tomorrow. (laughs) And so instead I was like, what if you shifted the goal to be like, I'm going to have as much fun as humanly possible whenever I go out with someone or I'm going to really be present and enjoying the person in front of me as much as possible instead of having this other goal. And I think if you shift the goal into all of these beautiful examples that you're giving of like, how much can I revel in the juiciness of this woman? Or it very likely will lead to the goal that you once actually had. Totally. This is something that I go into a lot with my clients who are coming to me for support with dating, Mm -hmm. which is yeah, on that first date, if you're looking for the mother of your child, that is going to put a lot of pressure on the whole date. If you go in with the intention of how can I discover our compatibility? How can I get to know this person better? How can I bring as much joy or honesty to this date? It it allows you to actually get to know the person in a way that you might not if you were looking with this goal that wasn't actually appropriate for that stage in the relationship. As you go along dating, then your goals, the the goal for the 10th date might be like, maybe we talk about kids. Is this person compatible for me in that way? But the goals for the 10th date might look really different than the goals for the first date. Yeah. Yeah. That's so great. Okay. I wanted to ask you also about sexual confidence and what are ways to build that? I know we've already talked about overcoming the pressure to perform and so much of that will help build someone's confidence sexually, but what would you say in that realm? Yeah, I think there are two branches to gaining confidence. And one is work doing, I would say, the inner aspects of building confidence, looking at the way that I work with clients, like look, doing parts work, looking at the part, what part of me feels unconfident. How can I care for that part? How can I give it what it needs? How can I develop my confidence internally? And it's all internal, but this I'm specifically referring to the like emotional integration, psychological integration aspects of what past 
pain points are there that are still held within my psyche and my body and keeping me from feeling confident. And then the other branch is how can I train so that I become more confident? How do I actually expand my tool belt? How do I learn more techniques? How do I train my body and my nervous system in order to last longer or in order to be able to circulate arousal through my body? How can I actually develop those skills so that I feel confident in them? Because if you do only the inner work, but none of the training, then that that can only go so far. And if you do only the training and none of the inner work, that can only go so far. And so the way that I see it is we need to really have both of, okay, how can I, once again, find the part of me, find the version of me that feels unconfident and really take care of it, really ask it what it's afraid of, really investigate that part, what it feels like, what it needs. Maybe even find the part of me that feels super confident and see how I can continue to work with that identity and continue to strengthen that identity and intentionally call upon it. And then within, let's say, sexual confidence, a lot of men grew up masturbating quickly, quietly, and shamefully, Mm -hmm. finishing as fast as possible, training the body in a very specific way. As I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this in private by myself, do it as fast as possible. I hope no one hears me or sees me or knows that it's happening. And often there's like an undercurrent of shame there or of guilt or of pain or fear. And then expect to quote unquote perform differently. But it's really hard to perform differently than we've been training our bodies for many years. And and very few men who I've met grew up with a really healthy sex education where they were learning to circulate their sexual energy, where they were learning to um, be in a really healthy, positive, loving relationship to their own sexuality. And so the training aspects are like, oh, I never learned this. So I can actually train myself to last longer. I can train myself to be more erect for longer periods of time. I can train myself to thrust in a way that feels better. I can practice techniques with my mouth, with my hands, with my cock that actually feel really good for both of us. So there are also all of these techniques and tools that we can learn, which alongside that inner work helps to build confidence because we've learned, we've brought into the tool belt. We have more technique, more skill in that realm. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate hearing these two kind of parallel paths because I think just experiencing individuals that like have done one but not the other and like how different that is. And yeah, you can do all of the physical, physiological tools and practices and trainings. But if you haven't explored what's internally in the depths of your psyche and yourself, it only will take you so far. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. I know this is one thing that I've been asked quite often in this space is around, and you actually mentioned it earlier, around the piece of separating ejaculation and orgasm and like semen retention and kind of those pieces. I know some people find them like really interesting. And actually a a guy just recently asked me like if it's unhealthy to go through the path of semen retention. I know there's so much information out there that like says yes and says no. So what is your kind of take on those pieces? My take on those pieces, my my take on semen retention is awareness and intentionality are mm-hmm. the most important aspects of it. When we go into a dogmatic relationship to it, then it tends to inherently not be as healthy because it's dogmatic and there's this sort of like, if I ejaculate then I'm not less of a man and I have less testosterone and then I'm not gonna have any energy and then how can I provide for my it gets a little bit shamey where mm-hmm. then I've definitely seen men who are in a semen retention practice and then they ejaculate once by accident and it sends them into a whole spiral of I just fucked up the whole thing it's not even worth it and so now and then they go into this pattern of quote unquote, like returning to old habits because there's this idea of I have to do it perfectly, which I have to do it perfectly. I have to never ejaculate otherwise ABC. And there's this, again, this like undercurrent of shame that can get woven in, not all the time, but I definitely see that in some areas. And I think there's nothing worse for our sexual health than shame. 
And so my take on it is, yes, it's incredibly powerful to have semen retention, to practice semen retention from so many men who I've worked with and who I've talked to, friends, clients, teachers. There is it's such a powerful practice to, first of all, be able to maintain the literal nutrients that is lost, like the energy that you lose from ejaculation, to be able to maintain that and utilize that physical and energetic essence for other things, to be able to transmute it. And this isn't, I will also specify, this isn't no fap, where it's just you don't touch yourself. I'm speaking specifically to the practice of intentional masturbation, where you are creating your, you are um, engaging with sexual energy, cultivating that energy, but then utilizing it for strengthening your mind, for strengthening your body, for uh, clarifying your purpose, for increasing motivation, for balancing out hormonal hormonal levels. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways to use it for work, for sports, for spiritual growth. And so I'm referring specifically to we're still engaging with that energy, but using it very intentionally and also the capacity to last much longer, the, the capacity to get much harder. And so there are so many benefits. And my view on it is to be relaxed around it, to, to find your own healthy relationship to it. And I don't, there are so many different studies around if you don't ejaculate, it's bad for you. If you do ejaculate, this is what happens. And they all say different things. And very few of the studies are actually done on men who are then very intentionally working with the energy. So it's hard to say, but I am not one to say never ejaculate. Yeah. Ejaculate every once in a while. And when you do it, make it intentional. Enjoy it so deeply. Mm -hmm. Make it like tonight I'm going to do this or yes, I'm choosing to, to do this. So there's choice because that's so empowering for yourself physically, emotionally, energetically, sexually. My take is always find what works for you. Find Mm -hmm. what feels balanced and what feels healthy for you. And play around. Fuck around and find out. Try it out. See how it feels and see what works for you. Don't take someone else's word for it. Do your own thing and and Um, discover what works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that you said that. It's funny. I years ago had a partner who literally, he was like, if I don't jog off every morning, I cannot focus like during the day. And that was like his thing. And I don't know what necessarily that was all about per se, but he was like, this is what works for me. But it's interesting because you mentioned like using that energy for other things. And it's like talking about sexual energy in general, how I know some practices to help like generate it and move it and pull it up and into your body. But what is another, are there any ways that you think are really great to start helping someone connect to their sexual energy? I think one, so I talked a little bit about having a masturbation practice, like where you're training yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think to create an intentional time where you are experiencing your own sexuality without an external stimulation. So without pornography, without a partner, without, without photos, and you're literally just paying attention to what's happening. You're just paying attention to what your sexual energy feels like, what your arousal feels like, what your cock feels like, what a 30% arousal feels and an 80% arousal feels. And I think building some form of intentional masturbation practice, maybe you're practicing edging, moving towards ejaculation and then back away and then towards ejaculation and then back away or towards orgasm, back away. And Taking that time to connect into self, so many of us have only ever or have very rarely actually been fully present with ourselves in a masturbation practice, right? We're like either looking at something, watching something, listening to something, fantasizing, and rarely just focused on mm-hmm. on sensation. Again, not, not true for everybody, but definitely a theme that I see. And so building a, an intentional masturbation practice and maintaining connection to your breath, noticing your breath and noticing what you can do with your breath, like noticing how you can bring yourself to a higher state of arousal or a lower state of arousal just using your breath. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like in my own personal experience, I've found also that 
when I am personally more connected to my experience, those self-pleasure experiences are significantly more amazing. And I'm like, I don't want it any other way. I talk to a lot of couples who end up putting their self-pleasure or masturbation practice to the side once they're in partnership. Mm. And I think when in partnership, that's one of the most important times to to maintain the connection to the self-pleasure practice. Your sex with your partner will be so much better if you are intentionally cultivating and engaging with your sexual energy and getting to know yourself sexually in that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. You mentioned a couple of times this piece about shame, and I really appreciate you bringing that to light because I know like societally, there's a lot of talk around like the shame that women experience in sex and not so much what men can experience. And even just in thinking about their masturbation when they were younger and like the shame that's just innately associated with sex, what is like the first step of releasing that a little bit? And I'm sure it's different for everybody, but yeah, it definitely is. And what I've found to be some of the most important tools there, and these might sound a little bit challenging to do, but <clears throat> these are things that can be practiced <laughs> and developed. Mm-hmm. One is to literally just feel the physical sensation of the shame. Often shame disconnects us from ourselves, just takes over our entire experience. And I've found, because this is something, yes, in men I've worked with, but also in, in myself, when shame comes up, if I can observe the sensation of shame so maybe it's like a knot in my belly and like a nausea that's starting to move up from the belly up into the throat Mm -hmm. if i can just feel the sensation of it Mm -hmm. it helps personally it helps me so much to be able to maintain a connection to myself and not get totally swept away by the shame totally taken into a different world or totally Uh, taken out of presence or completely controlled by that shame. Mm -hmm. So literally just noticing the sensations of it is a huge piece. Mm -hmm. And the other piece, the other tool is parts work, getting to know the different parts of ourselves. And this is something that we can do alone. We can do this with a practitioner, uh, but really navigating, I mentioned this before, which part of me feels unconfident in this one, what part of me is feeling ashamed. How old is he? What does he look like? What's he most afraid of? And those inner conversations can help us come into, help us really integrate the different aspects of ourselves and develop a relationship to these challenging qualities like shame and to get to know the shame or the part of either the shame itself or the part of me that is ashamed to really get to know it. What is this shame trying to teach me? Where is this where do I feel this shame and why at some point did I absorb this? We don't need to know the why, right? We don't need to know the whole story, but sometimes it can be really helpful to to look at where did this come from? Is this mine? What does this shame want me to know? What is this shame teaching me? And being in relationship to it so that we're not, when we're trying to push it away, any part of our psyche, any part of our being, when we, when we reject it and we put it down into the basement, goes into the basement and it, pumps iron, right? It just gets strong. <laughs> and so yeah. when we actually interface with those pieces and we get to know them and we ha- build a relationship to them, they stop controlling us. Mm-hmm. They stop switching the breaker in the basement and <laughs> controlling us <laughs> from the unseen parts. We actually build a relationship to them and then we can come into healthy dynamic. With them. Yeah. Yeah. That shame's down there, like turning off all the electricity, the power, <laughs> the water. <laughs> yeah. Smashing the pipes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at me. Yeah. I am such a proponent of parts work. And it takes a lot, I think, a lot of courage to be able to turn towards those pieces of ourselves and actually give them a voice and give them the attention that they're so deeply craving. And it can be really actually scary and hard to do at first. But when you start doing it, I find that it becomes incredibly supportive and a lot easier with time like anything the more you practice it the easier it becomes totally yeah yeah is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think would just be really exciting and juicy and important for someone that's listening to hear Mm. 
whenever I talk about this work, and specifically if I talk about there's like the inner work that we do and then the, the outer work, like the tools, the techniques, the practices. So many people are like, what are the tools? What are the techniques? What are the practices? I want to train in that. And so I really encourage people to, like I said, develop an intentional self-pleasure practice where you're that's the space where you can go to work with the tools. Mm-hmm. And I, I already mentioned breath, but edging as a practice, if you don't already have an edging practice, I so recommend practicing edging, bringing yourself to a higher state of arousal and then coming back away from it, bringing yourself closer, coming back away from it. And the more that you do this, the more that you, your body can rest in those higher states of arousal and can rest in those higher states of arousal without going over the edge, without hitting the point of no return. And the more you start to lean into that edge and the more you edge towards that point of no return and masterfully start to be able to breathe and soften your body, breathe deeply and relax and soften your body and be able to to away from it, that's also where the non-ejaculatory orgasms start to be available. And so if you just do an edging practice for years, you can develop so much awareness. You can develop so many incredible levels of skill and, and attention within your sexuality that can truly bring you into a masterful relationship to your sexuality. So having an edging practice and then utilizing breath and relaxation, you can also utilize, there are tons of tools you can use. You can use the microcosmic <laughs> orbit. You can use different um pelvic floor squeezes, but just utilizing breath and relaxation with that edging practice can reveal so much and can help you train the body so deeply. So that's a a tool that you can do it three times a week. Once again, when we have grown up training our sexuality in one way, sometimes it can take a little bit of time. So I always like to recommend if you're wanting to lean into your sexuality and developing skills and developing your awareness and your cultivation, practice three times a week. Do it like you were, practice as though you were going to the gym because you're training your body, you're training your nervous system, you're training your psyche, you're training your emotions, you're training your whole being to to make love in a different way. And so coming to that training practice and edging is such a beautiful way to deepen into that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And yeah, I think in any anyone that's wanting to expand what's possible in their intimacy, like dedicating yourself to doing it for an extended period of time. I find, oh, I I tried it a couple of times. That isn't, I mean, maybe for some people that's enough to get to the next level, but I find that the time piece is something that people struggle with, but is so important to to really just accept and enjoy. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. this all feels great. So you should do it all the time anyway. Like the, yeah, it's the best homework. It's the best thing yeah. to return to and practice. And actually that is one piece. Sometimes when people think of it as homework, then it takes the joy out of it of, no, I've got to go back, do my training. When you think of it as I get to go expand my pleasure, I go get to know myself sexually. I get to train my body while having the most expansive mm-hmm. pleasure ever. Like it, it makes it a lot easier to show up to your practice. Yeah, you're not like I'm going to the gym and it's going to be painful. This yeah, is the opposite of that. Yeah, amazing. amazing. You are so wonderful and have this really incredible energy and voice. And I would love to hear if anyone wants to work with you or connect with you, where they can continue this conversation and explore what you have to offer more. Yeah, thank you. People can find me at fabiananeek.com or on Instagram at Fabiananeek, that's F-A-B-I-E-N-E-A-N-I-C-K. A lot of extra letters in the character. <laughs> they all do something though, I promise. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, people can find me there and, and find out more about all of my offerings. A primary signature offering is a 12-week men's sexuality deep dive, which happens a couple times a year, but will, will be happening in, in January again. And I also do, yeah, sexuality focus, but then also dating support and and I do retreats as well. So those two spots are the places to find me and to reach out and, and access more of what I do. Awesome. Amazing. I know we didn't even really talk too much about dating, so we'll have to do that again some other time. But thank you <laughs> so much for coming on and sharing and 
I hope everyone leaves this episode and they go and they do their pleasure practice and they explore edging and do all of the wonderful (laughs) things that you shared. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to talk to another woman who cares so deeply about men and men's sexuality and and all this. Great to know you're you're out there doing this work. Thank you. (laughs) 